Hello and welcome to our new series under African Skies. We are thrilled that our generous speakers were available to give our talk this fall, even though this program was originally um, scheduled for spring, but of course for COVID we had to reschedule. We are going to start with a bit of a flavor just to get us in the mood of the African continent. And then today we're going to focus on Uganda in the eastern part of the continent. There is going to be an opportunity at the end of the program to ask uh, Jacqueline questions. Um, and if that's the case, please put them in the chat, excuse me, put them in the chat um, box of YouTube and we'll do our very best to answer your questions. We seem to have, um, we need maybe another little minute to make sure that everybody will join us for today. Um, I just want to say that this has been a real pleasure to put the program together. I've had opportunities now to speak with five different um, people affiliated with UWM from five different countries of Africa. And it's been wonderful for me to learn more about their cultures. Um, in this case, I'm going to ask questions just because I know that I had a lot to learn. So this is going to be more of a conversation with Jacqueline today. Um, so I hope you, you, uh, you enjoy it and yeah, you learn something too. I would like to introduce our speaker today, uh, Jacqueline. I'm gonna check, please, excuse me. Kirungi, Kirungi. Um, she is from Uganda. She's a graduate student at UWM in the African and African Diaspora Studies. Today, she's going to speak to us about her homeland and I wish you were here to give her a very warm welcome, um, but you can do this virtually with us. So help me welcome Jacqueline to talk to us about her country. You're welcome and I'm glad to be here with you tonight. It's a pleasure. Please join with me as we journey to Uganda virtually. <laughs> it will be a pleasure. 
So we're going to start with little, we're going to have uh, three musical interludes in the program. And we're going to start with a special song that's connected to marriage. Jacqueline will tell us about these traditions. Yeah, as you see in this image, this boy is very smiley. This girl is Davi Davi, a this boy. And actually, they are imitating what used to be the traditional wear in Uganda in the olden days before I was born. <laughs> but we still get these little episodes of bring, back, uh, bring those memories of the uh, past into today. And this is what you see the boys, the, the, uh, the youth or the man is putting on. It's a back cloth. And this is a marriage song trying to present, not trying, but actually depicting the picture of what marriage has turned today. Right. And in this song, the artist is telling us, see what it used to be. It was always a joyful moment when a girl and a boy decided to bring a partner home when it was time to make a family. And the singer is trying to bring into, fix, to bring to us the picture of what is seeming to run out of, to, 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 to go through our hands. That is those moments of saying, let me take my partner home. And because the youth today, especially in my generation, seem to do their things their own way. And in this song, the writer or the artist is saying, you are missing a moment which was always celebrated. And that moment, as if she's trying to say, it was always joyous, it was celebrated, the culture celebrated, the clan celebrated with you when it was time for making a family. And so she's trying to say, look, it was always good. And this is the, the music you're going to hear playing, dancing to the tune of what it meant to bring a man home. So there's um, your lovely country in East Africa. Yeah. Do tell uh, us about the coolest flag ever. <laughs> yeah, it's the, the flag of Uganda. And it is, as you see, black, yellow, and red. And these colors stand for one of the things, they stand for not I think, I'd love to use that word, but the, they stand for, they stand to represent the things that you always not miss about Uganda and yellow, the sunshine. The sunshine shines in Uganda from January to December. And even when it is the rainy season, uh, after heavy showers, which normally takes three to four hours, it will still be shiny and it will be really hot. And so this is the yellow in this flag. The red, I'm sure those who have been to Uganda, they will tell you, you will not miss to notice the sense of community in Uganda. Uh, they will come, I can't say all, but at least that's one thing you really will notice about when you go to Uganda. Everyone is welcome. It's that brotherhood, it represents the brotherhood, the connectedness of the people and the tribes in Uganda. And I want to tell you we have 56 tribes, but we live along each other. And we have this black, which represents the Fatesoys and the people who are black in that country upon which the country depends. And the crane, 
it's called the gray ground crane. Uh, it's, it's cherished for its colorfulness, but also it's known as an elegant bird and it was chosen to be a, a bird of national significance. And that's why you see it in the flag. Welcome to Uganda. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, this is Uganda and its neighbors. As you see, those are our neighbors. And when they're at war, we're at war. When they're peaceful, we are, we are peaceful. But at least Uganda is one of those countries that has lived with minimum peace um, among its neighbors. And because of that, you will meet so many Kenyans in Uganda who have come because of civil war. You meet South, South Sudanese in Uganda, Congolese, Rwandese, Tanzania, and that is Uganda. Like they have become part of us and they become part of them. I want to say I've not been to South Sudan, I've not been to Tanzania, but I shall surely tell you that my neighbors are South Sudanese, some are Kenyans, and that's what makes Uganda. It's a, a country that welcomes as people come by. And also it's a landlocked country. So I think that explains our crisscrossing, which seems normal, but, and actually normal because we live by each other. And what you see on the left is the scene you'll get that represents the capital city of Uganda, which is Kampala city, a city very, highly populated, it entertains all. It's the center of our culture, it's the center of our economics, the center of politics. And it's anchored on one of our kingdoms, but it's a very admired place and every tribe tra struggles to be here. <laughs> That's why we have not, we have refused federal for this case because everybody wants to struggle to be in that city because that's why you find everything that you want, at least to have a test of, you will come to, to Kampala. And this the is your hometown, right? Yeah, I've, I've, I've been born and raised here. Normally in my country, when you say, I come from Kampala, they're like, oh my, that is everyone's place. So where do you come <laughs> from exactly? <laughs> so that's why you, you tend to refrain to say I come from there, but I've been raised and born here. Not born here, but raised here. And right grown here yeah uh this is Markshan falls uganda it's one of the the most at tourist attraction centers in uganda because of its falls as you hear it Markshan falls yeah and this is one place i have gone to admire as i'll tell you that ugandans this is queen elizabeth in this in this case on our on our on our right is Queen Elizabeth. From afar is how it appears, a very low lying part of the country with undulating hills. As you see, this, this, uh, it is a rift valley. It has parts which are really dry, but also parts which are really green. And it harbors most of the flora and fauna of Uganda, but also most of the different animals in Uganda. But also this place, particularly I have my child memories in this place. I think it was the first time I went out from my home to visit a national park. And all I remember was the first time I slept outside my father's home and you're like, wow, I'm in the wilderness. But I want to tell you beyond that, we don't visit these places, we go through them. And this one place which has a really cool scenery as you, you, you're in a, in a public means or driving through the country we really want to cross by this place because of its low lying and letting hills and the animals you cross by accidentally. Right. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, you cannot talk about Uganda without its crops. Uganda is a heavily agriculturally based country. A culture, like a culture is a mainstay and tea, it's something you can't do away from Uganda. When I came here, I realized that people here cherish coffee. <laughs> but in my country, it's tea. It's tea. Every home you visit, there will be a cup of tea put for you. And it's corn. It's bananas. And this really 
also make most of our, of our roadside fresh markets. And I think something I really miss about my country that you will be walking from the city, from, from, from your office or from wherever you've been in the evening and you just go by and say, hey, some fresh corn, some fresh banana. And this is a thing just by the road street every evening brought by farmers from nearby in the city. Nice. So, yeah. I chose to represent a Baltare sitter of all celebrated moments in Uganda's history because of my family. My father is a veteran and I'm telling you one thing I've come to know, soldiers love being soldiers. They won't forget when those moments of their time as veterans come to the scene. And growing up as a child of a veteran, this was a function that whenever it was celebrated, you, had, you could not avoid not to say it because my father would be watching the whole day as this function goes by. And it's also a time whereby we celebrate uh, what we celebrate today, which is the minimum peace in Uganda, because it was on this day, February, 6th February, that there was an official launch and attack on the ruling government by then, led by Milton Oboti. And this attack led to what became a five-year guerrilla war in Uganda that ushered into the, the current government into power. And what came since then was a different face of the army. And I can tell you from the background of my mother, my father, the army is no longer the army we knew in the 1960s. At least I was not born by then, but this I know people have told me that in the 1970s and, in, and mid 1980s, a soldier was a threat. A soldier meant death. A soldier meant looting. But when the current government under which we celebrate this function came into power, it worked hard to harmonize the relationship between civilians and, and, the, and, and the army, which now is called the Uganda People's Defense, Defense Force, that in, on this day, they take it upon themselves to clean the city, to do health drives, so that to create a new memory in Ugandans, to celebrate soldiers and fear soldiers. And I think growing up as a Ugandan, I think this has worked in my memory, memory that I know a soldier is a friend, a soldier is someone who wants to see, to be seen as, as a person serving you, not as a threat. And so this has been achieved through this function, Tara Hesita. The Uganda Matters Day is a serious day in Uganda and it's a national day. And Uganda is heavily a Christian country in all their facets as Christians, as Anglicans, as Pentecostals, but also we have our Muslim brothers. But Uganda Matters Day exactly is a day commemorated mainly by Christians. And on this day is a historical moment whereby the Kabaka or the king, that's the name we call, the local name for a king is Kabaka, staged a resistance against the British colonial rulers by ordering the execution of over 30 regents of the king who had become Catholic converts and some Anglican converts, and they were beheaded. And this was a landmark moment in our, in our history that not only gained populacy in Uganda, but to the whole world, such that on this day, we receive people from different walks of the world coming to commemorate Uganda matters because they, not only, they don't only become people's, people who died in Uganda, but now they have become they have got canonized in the Catholic Church, and Rome sends a Pope Nuncio to celebrate this day. And we have not only stopped at celebrating them, but their names nowadays 
I think not only nowadays, but since the time they were colonized, have become names equal to Christian names from other walks of life. And so this day is a national day that even calls the president. The president marks this day, he always officiates this day. And after he leaves, interestingly, for him only shows up to officialize the day and he goes and the Christians keep celebrating their day. So I'm gonna ask because I really like to hear it. Mm -hmm. You mentioned now that because um, the, the people have been uh, canonized, that means that, they're, that the original names of the people could be used now for Christian names. And you said a couple, can you please say those again? <laughs> yeah, we have names like Joseph Valikudembe, and here is Valikudembe, which is a, a local name. Mukasa is a traditional right. name in Uganda, and it's now a Christian name that right. Christians name their children because these people become matters right. in the country. Yeah. Nice, thank you. So we're we'll going on to my favorite part, which of course is, <laughs> is food. Please tell us about that. This is also a very interesting part for me. I love food. And <laughs> what makes this really interesting today, it's, it reminds me of the starchy food we like, the soups we like. And as you can see in this plate, the different types of starchy, starch foods that I think that's why you can also like soup because soup can also help you eat that food. And on left is a plate. We have that yellow stuff you see is what we call matoke. The other side is rice and this side is corn, which we call maize in my place. And this is food you'll find in every, almost every home in Uganda. They can never miss a week or I think some even a day without taking matoke and, other, and the foods you see here. So yeah, those are the foods. And how did it feel for you the first time you went to a really fancy schmancy <laughs> meal in the US and what was missing? Soup, there's no <laughs> soup. And I was like, well, I'm at a very fancy well, those who took me out were like, we're going to have a dinner with you. I'm like, I can't wait to eat the soup. I've been missing it. Um, there was no soup. <laughs> they told me to choose dessert. They told me to choose everything. I thought they would say, choose soup. There was nothing like soup. So <laughs> I missed that. Yeah. There's another starch-filled plate there. <laughs> but a little chicken, too. Uh, yeah. It's chicken too on this plate. Is that a is that a curry? Is that a hot sauce? Do you think in the chicken? We don't eat hot sauce. I uh, they just actually spice it up in a actually also another difference. Yeah, when I was here, spice meant hot something, but in Uganda, spice means you bring different types of 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 of, of flavors or vegetables to give soup a different taste so this would be a lot of tomatoes onions and greens name it eggplants all will be mixed in to give nice. that soup a heavy taste yeah nice and yeah this 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 is a scene you find in an average uh kitchen in uganda uh, we shall have on the on on on, on our right, on our left extreme left is a pot that this is for us it's a traditional container that is used to store but also to give food a, a different flavor that you will not get if you cook your food in a in a in a steel a steel saucepan or a steel container and so we really cherish this this container which is made out of clay and. Originally, it has been used to store water. If you want to keep your water cool, as I told you, it's a country that has sunshine all through the year. But also if you wanted your water to have a particular taste, I see here they, they put some flavors in water. Here we boil some leaves, boil banana leaves, and as you remove them, 
you wash it a little bit and you put in your water and your water will get a particular taste and scent that as you take it is cool but also has a nice flavor and on our extreme right you see, i don't know if you know this but these are clay stoves we have clay stoves we cook with charcoal 90 percent of ugandans cook on charcoal and you will know that we are now struggling with deforestation mm. because we cut down our trees always to get charcoal and you see the saucepans in them uh, is food covered in banana leaves. We cook with banana leaves in Uganda. You can't, it's, it's, uh, it's not that you can't, but it's a, the most admirable way when you have to make a meal mm -hmm. and you cover it in banana leaves because they give food, whether it is corn, whether it is matoke, they give it a particular taste and scent that everybody would want to hear smelling and not when you're cooking, someone is cooking and all you hear is that scent coming out from your food. And right. we call, it's kind of a reusable, you, everybody will struggle to buy a banana leaf, especially for those who stay in the city. We don't have banana plantations, but at least in every market you find a banana leaf, you can buy them, some people reuse them, but you don't reuse banana leaves more than two times. So. It's as reusable as you can use it for two times, but that's how we cook our food. Okay. Mm. Sounds great. Let's look at some art. And this is, yeah, it's a modern art in Uganda. I just like it. <laughs> at least that's something you would see in, if you would go to the university look at their art and gallery room, you will know what is art once you're there and all you see are um, models of different things. And- I love this person's face. I love that <laughs> stature, I really do. I think that's one, it's beautiful. So expressive. Yeah, I yeah. love it. Yeah. And this is a craft. I like to call it craft, but this is what um, it's 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 kind of a traditional um, kind of making of containers and re, uh, yeah containers and utensils in Uganda. These are made from fibers, natural fibers in Uganda. Though we color them in the extreme left is what we'd call like carpets in America. Those are kind of our carpets. And these are not only carpets for the sake of them, but they are really traditional carpets. We use them when marrying of girls, but also when people grow old, they always want to have this carpet around them because they easily can sit down. We don't, old people in Uganda don't prefer sitting in the chairs. Mm -hmm. They lay these, these uh, uh, mats, we call them mats on the ground and sit there. But also if when people, in what would call a moment of telling stories, especially with the elderly. If you have to talk to your, to your grandmother, mm. you would love to sit on this and he would, she would be really feeling so good with you as you sit on her on this mat. And some of these you see in the extreme light, right in the lower part of, the, of, of this image. We serve in those, those are containers we used to serve what we call millet flour, which is also next to corn. This is just millet, and this is like a traditional food you serve in most of homes. When you, and so this is a serving container in the, extreme, the extreme end. They're very yeah. pretty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of very pretty, check this out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are, this is Uganda and, and fabrics in Uganda, uh, different ethnic communities have different designs. And this, this normally captures an image of fabrics that Ugandans prefer, other Ugandans prefer wearing on in different celebrations. In the extreme right, uh, you'd see in the lower corner, it's actually a moment of what people put on when they're marrying off. In the middle might be a, is a bride and the rest 
uh, escorting her to appear before a crowd that she's being be married of. And then in the middle, this is normally a kind of a way that is loved by one of our central major tribes in the country called the Baganda. And for them, when they dress up, you hardly have to show the other too much of yourself. So you they dress up the whole body. And in the left extreme corner, they're not very different. You see these wares are not very different from the ones in the, in the lower right corner. These are like Western Uganda tribes prefer to put on like this. And you will see that actually the, what they are carrying in their hand, kind of like a, a bag, is something they do when they are marrying off. So these are kind of really celebratory fabrics in Uganda. Yeah, very pretty. Mm. Let's check out some famous buildings. Yeah, this is Uganda's parliament. It's as old as its independence in 1962. 1962. Yeah. Very nice. And this is where motions are moved in the country. And what we see next is a center for Uganda, for where Uganda performs its culture. New poems, new songs on the scene, mainly what we'd call traditional folk songs will be performed here as they appear new on the scene. So normally every Friday or Saturday, there'll be a play running in this center. And that's why I say it's not only a cultural center, but it's a center where Uganda performs its culture. Yeah, where culture is made today. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's great. And a special place for you, Jacqueline. Indeed. I grew up being told you must work to come here. Like, <laughs> oh, really? So it's one of those oldest and largest universities in Uganda. And I tell you, the little moments I remember with my parents when you went out, she would say, could we go visit Maker? And you're like, yes. And the moment you're there, you're like, I want to work hard and you come here and you're like, okay. I'll do my best. But <laughs> Makere is not only to me, but generally celebrated in the East African community. As you come to discover, most of the three presidents in the three East African countries studied at Makere in the 40s and later became presidents as East African countries were gaining independence from the British colonial rule. And here is the library. And as I'll tell you that the library has grown as Makere grew, it's, you will see this, the, the, these are the different, it is a, a big, a huge thing. And I'll tell you, you will enjoy it as far as your student and the staff in Makere University. One place you can't miss when you have to read seriously is the library. And I don't mean to say, that other libraries don't do that. But trust me, <laughs> growing up in a country and being born and raised there, the only place you'd go and you feel your reading is the library. Because otherwise, other spaces, you're a community and you must talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no reading. No reading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These are dwellings in Uganda. The different facets of dwellings in Uganda, as you'll see, the down dwellings, which are kind of massive, large houses, these are normally dwellings you find in the suburbs of the country. And the top, at least the top one, on the topmost one in on your on your left, is a commercial. These are the kind of dwellings found in commercial centers or upcoming town centers and towns a number of them come out of trading and marketing. And so you will discover that this here, people sleep in these dwellings, the one that is painted pink, but also operate business in these dwellings. And that pink for me coming from Uganda, the moment I see it, 
it's a it's a, a pain that most telecommunication companies take advantage of these commercial dwellings and they paint people's houses as a way to advertise their companies. And this is one we, would, we call Airtel or a ready company. And as they paint your, 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 your house, they improve its appearance, but also sometimes they bring your phone booth that you see in that process, people come to make calls at your home. We pay money most, we, we, though we are moving to the point where each person has a mobile phone, but at least in the town of far off the city centers, they call through a common phone, phone booth that will be found in a trading center or in a town. So as they come to make this call, then they'll boost the business of that person by buying the different items in that person's shop. Right. That that pink is pretty electric. I guess <laughs> you wouldn't confuse it with another company. Mm -mm. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Let's take a look at some of these landscapes. Some of them, um, I know that you uh, mentioned that most people in Uganda live in rural landscape. So you felt it was important that we talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Because really, if I felt like, yeah, that was one way you would see the other part of Uganda. That every time I cross to the rural Uganda, I feel a different, I breathe a different air. But mm -hmm. also I immediately know that I'm in a different part of the country by the dwellings, by the small crisscrossing roads you see, where you see that lady in the middle. You only you always see those small crisscrossing roads through like, people's lands, and you want the one, the other surface uh, image you see in the left uh, lower corner is a road to the rural area in Uganda. You hardly see it; they find it next to the city, normally in the towards the rural areas, and uh, these other dwelling just. Uh, landscape you're seeing in the lower right side of the image. Those are the scenes, the, the contact surfaces you come, some places you come into contact with or scenes you come into contact with as you extend far off into the rural upcoming centers in the, in the country. And, and you had mentioned this was a bit of a social place, right? So the community- yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, gather yeah. together and chat uh -huh. um, and as they youth. did their shopping, I guess. Yeah, you'll see many youth, especially boys, as you can see. Boys, they feel that they're putting on trousers or shirts. They right. They'll be gathering up in these centers to talk through the day, to buy something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is a place where I'm born from. Mm. Born in the sense that my parents hail from here. Wow. This, and this is called Kavaroli District, Western Uganda. And this is, is the, the scene that you see as you walk into this into this town. It's, it's, the, it's portrait it's, it's the town of Kavaroli District. Green, as you see it. It's known, for, it's known for being green, at least in, this, in the whole country, all through the year. And I would like to tell you that this is it's, it's at the lower lower end of Mount, what we call Mountains of the Moon, or Mount, Mount Renzori. So it shares that that geographical future. I think I think that keeps it served with rain and cool temperatures. Hence the green, mm. right? Yeah, and those images in the left side of in the, in the on the right is a scene that you come into contact with as you narrow into the center of the city, heading up to yeah through the city, the town. So we'll talk about some famous people. And this is another short, I guess, um, musical interlude. Uh, they're singing gospels, right? 
Yeah, it's a gospel of music. So this is an interesting lady. Please tell us more about her. Yeah, this is a lady that I've grown to know in my time. Very significant political um, woman, but also a writer of, of her time in my time. I can say because we are not a writing community, so. She has taken the crown among the women, at least in the popular, popular culture of Uganda. And she has written several books. These are the few that I, I focus on, The Official Wife, The Switch. And she's normally known for blending stories uh, to show contest, contestations emerging in culture. And she writes about female gender mutilation, its role before and how it is seen today and how it has grown through the time to appear what has become to be today, which has been social, sexual violence, but before it was a cherished moment. And she's a mother, she's a politician, she's a wife. Unfortunately, I've known she lost soon, her husband passed away, but she's a woman who has staged I think she's a role model in that she's not only a writer, but an MP, a, a member of parliament, a women member of parliament for his city, for her, for her home district in Western Uganda. Though I'm told wow. that she recently lost a chance to go back to represent them because I think she's overwhelmed also that they are demanding you have to come back home. We don't see your home. You <laughs> At the service I, of the president than the community. So I and I, that's what I like about her community. It, it stages a fight immediately. Things don't go the way they thought they go. So right. yeah. We have a famous poet. This is a famous poet that you don't you won't fail to know if you really are to dig into the history of literates or elites in Uganda or caught. Pabitek, uh, born in Northern Uganda. She moves to, he moves to UK to begin his studies as a footballer. And in the UK, he becomes a, a, a serious language student. And his, his poem, The Song of Lawino, has become now, I think, a global poem, at least in the African perspective, if you have to understand the struggle that Africa has had with the Western culture as it came to interface with, the, with, with African culture, the book you have to go to is Song of Lawino, who in his, in his book, he gives an account of what it meant when he left UK to be at home in Northern Uganda and how his wife would like, always questioning, you are not the one I know, you are not a man, you are not doing your role. You, so in this book, he narrates what it meant as he interfaced, as he found himself in the middle of African culture Cultures, yeah. and, Western, you, you, and, and Western culture. So Very. he's someone you need to know about Uganda. Mm. Yeah. And I must say, for me, this is a, a model youth in Uganda. Uh, Robert Chaglani and his wife. I grew up in their time, and I'm no longer youth. I must say, <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> but I know I went to school with his with this lady, who is now his wife, and for me, they are a model in the sense that they have challenged what used to be the untouchable of Uganda. In Uganda at my time, if 
your boyfriend was a musician and a drug user, which is still going on, but in our time it was terrible. You did not understand with that person. But her wife comes from a very honorable home. She's brought to Makere University to study and she ends up with this guy. This guy is known for taking drugs. This guy is known to perform music that represents people from the drug community. And the parents are like, we shall denounce you. You can't bring this man to us. And she's like, she stages a fight, but we came to know this later. And they have slowly but surely shown people to say we can be youth, mess up, but we track our journey to success. And I tell you today, I think a week ago he was nominated as a presidential candidate in Uganda. Wow. And he's a strong challenger of the current government because he's been staying in power for the last 40 years. And he's saying it's too much. He need to get out of power. And his wife has gone to support him no matter. And I'm telling you, he's no longer a drug addict. He stops drugs when he chose to be trained politics. And he's also a member of parliament of his community. So he's a taking success a success story. It's a success story from yeah. rugs to the parliament. To riches, yes, that's, that's a good story, <laughs> yes. Thank you for sharing those heroes of yours. That was really interesting. Now we were talking about some of the main communities. Yeah. So Karamo, the Karam, Karam, we call them the Karamajang or the Kijangs in Uganda is one of those country you have to reckon with in Uganda. It's a, a, a very, I can't say resistant community, but it's a community that has been seen at the ends of society in Uganda because of its defense for its culture. Mm. They are a cattle grazing community and they are pastoralists. They graze their, their animals by moving from one place to another. And I'm telling you, it still survives on today, but it's a celebrated community in Uganda because it has defended its time, it has defended its culture. Whatever it's government crazy. comes, is fighting it, but still survive. Wow, we like survivors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this one is um, also another cultural community in Uganda, an ethnic community. We call them the Wagisu. It's one of those tribes, communities known for circumcision practices. And that's what makes Uganda the variety. <laughs> Yeah. And this is the Banyankoli, the Banyankole community. It's the ruling ethnic community in Uganda. The president comes from here and they make a majority in the country. My mom comes here, comes from this country. Right. From this community. Yeah. It's at least one of those communities that has come, that has taken off, been rulers for a long time. and. We are saying it should be time up <laughs> <laughs> for others to come in. <laughs> yeah. So Chas. I was going to, um, would you like to say something about stars or somehow how you connect yeah. to the night sky? I really liked this. And I like, I, I still thank the program managers or the people who created this moment because who would know that we could talk about stars? but in a way we did under the sky. So it's very interesting, but stars are really something that you, that when it was brought to my mind, like actually, yeah, that's something we see from afar, but it's celebrated under the skies as, 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 as the program say, says, because stars are, celeb uh, are Come on, uh, you've walked in different ways in my in a country, and normally one of the things that have through which they invoked is because of their shining appearance. Girls are named after girls' names are after stars, like they are their communities that name their girls. Can you use it? Can you use it like you're as shining as a star? Yeah. And it represents normally a beautiful child as you know every child is beautiful for their parents so <laughs> at least 
that's one thing we know about the stars. And, and also they are used because they appear in a time when the country is not too hot, but also not too cold. And so you'd find that in this moment, that's when people love to move out of their homes. I mean, their dwellings and hang out in the night, what they call hanging out in, in America. But in Uganda, it's more of a story, storytelling time. And in that time, we are either sharing, roasting some maize, roasting, we, we roast most of, we don't roast meat. If you have it, you roast it, but we roast bananas, we roast potatoes, we roast cassava. And you will discover that those are the foods they would love to have out, hang out with, to have fun in the evening. And this, but this is also, these are rare moments, especially in the rural areas, yeah. Right. Um, how beautiful. I love that image. It's a beautiful image. And maybe we should wrap up with this song. Uh, I guess it's a traditional older yeah. song, but you chose it because it's so universal and so joyous. Yeah. It's, <laughs> So um, you're going to have a chance to say more, but I just would like to say thank you to you, Jacqueline. Thank you to everyone who's joined us so far. We will take some questions. I would like to acknowledge the support of the College of Letters and Science and also the Center for Gravitation, Cosmology and Astrophysics. We have a couple of questions that we thought people would like to hear your response to. And I will also look at the, um, at the chat to see if people have questions. We invite you to ask if you wish. You do have lots of greetings from uh, friends, uh, from colleagues, um, but I'll ask, what do you miss most about Uganda? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um... The usual. <laughs> it didn't change even when I moved out from Uganda. I miss the, the rural sceneries of Uganda. And as you see, I struggle to have them presented about in our, in our stories. Uh, because those are the moments when I'm out of the noise in the city, mm. when I'm in the rural Uganda. And what I like most is you see what you, do, you, you, you don't see or you miss, like when you, at every point you are in a row, in row you got, yeah, this is in my village, when you stand at a point, you see people farming, burning grass, and so smoke coming out, people going somewhere with their cows. So you're like, oh, I really miss this forest. So whenever you come in the village, I really like that moment. And that's what I really miss. Yeah. to my country. And what is your favorite place to visit when you go back? Where do you mm. want to go? Yes, when I came here, I got a favorite place to visit in Uganda. You can't imagine that I had first to come to America. <laughs> to imagine a favorite place to visit. Because as I told you, we, there's so much you take for granted when you're home mm -hmm. and, and, and you don't seem, you, you seem to say it's there and it will be there. I'll see it when I want. But when I came to Uganda, to America, and I'm, I'm like, I need to go back. And when I go back, one thing I won't really forget to schedule on the few moments I'll be there or if I'll be there, to so go visit and, and admire and admire like have a sense of a feel 
of what I've taken for granted, which is like the tourist attractions in Uganda. I want to tell you, much as that was, they're not, a, they don't look like tourist attractions for us, but I realized we missed a point. Like we need to, to value them by, by coming to, recogn to, to, to reckon on what, what we have and recognize what we have, but also have a feel of it, which we, we, which we don't when we are there. We think it's there, we shall be there when we want until you're out from there. <laughs> yeah, let's appreciate what we have, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that's what I have learned. Um, so we have a question from, as I said, lots of people are saying yay and uh, people are saying hello. We have a question from Joanne. Do you plan to return to Uganda in the future? I really plan to return to Uganda. Like I told you, when I came here, I must not say that I learned, I learned to know that I have to go back to Uganda when I came here. I want to tell you that that's a, this, this, I don't want to say that I didn't think of America as an important place, but when I was coming, it never crossed my mind that until I, was, until I had a chance to come here that I would be in America at point A. But it was so much a moment in my time that the only place that offered an opportunity for me to come and pursue my studies at that time was America when I applied. And until when I was here, then it struck me hard to know, like I will, I'm going back to the question I answered last, that there's a lot you did not harmonize in your country. Mm. As an African, the things I didn't appreciate about my country and I felt like we missed a point because growing up in my generation, I must say with how far I've come with academics or how far I am now, I'm pursuing my PhD, which is like my third degree, that I felt like it was not good to walk alone on your way. You need to bring home so many things. And so I, I always challenge myself when I'm about to say, oh, finish and find a job in America. And I'm like, I think you have a role to play on. You need to take the story home of what you went through, but also to make people appreciate. And you cannot make it, but you must leave it. They must see you leaving it. And you won't leave it unless you're with them. So that's what keeps on telling me, whatever you're doing, don't waste time. Do it quickly and tap into your efforts when you're still able to do, bring home what you felt you lost as you were on a journey, schooling, because I spent so much years in school and I feel I have to give back to my community. I feel like I lost a touch that I need to really bring yes. back home. Mm. A beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question um, from Bardig Voice and I'm not sure if, if you know the answer. Um, what stories do Ugandans tell about the stars? And what constellations did they identify? Constellations, as in see all constellations are when we take little groupings of stars and say, oh, that looks like a banana leaf, or this looks like I'm making stuff up now, but this <laughs> looks like um, maze. You might not know. Like, like I told you that um, growing up really what I knew and which I up to now which I got time to understand about is what we used to call wishing stars. We, I think in that time, growing up, we thought that when you saw something flash by like a star, it had come from up and was flashing by your face. And we call those, we call those wishing stars. So or shooting as, stars, yeah, or meteors. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. As soon as you saw it, you're like, oh, I wish this. So I think, and, and that's one way we really have come to grow to see how stars are, are, are in turn, um, can I say lived by with in Uganda? Hmm. Yeah, and beyond that, perhaps we look at stars as when you look up, most people will say it's following their, their we just admire, I must say, we're like, oh, look, the stars are out. The whole place is bright, so. But I've talked to my parents. That's what I like about coming here. Like, 
I, I called my mom, my father and I was like, could you tell me what you know about stars? And he said, oh, actually we have stories about stars. <laughs> wow. and, he, and he told me that stars normally we are seen, we are used to read, to read weather, read the weather in a season. So when stars were out, he told me for farming communities in their time, you'd plan, you'd think, you would begin imagining a good harvest mm. in that time. So they would plan what to plant. They were like, oh, the stars are out. We are going to have a, a, a good yield. But also she told, he told me that uh, for, for fishing communities, stars were a sign of it's time to go and lay your nets. Mm -hmm. So they use them to say once they are out and you see such out or you see appearing, they're appearing in such a way, then you may begin to go and lay your nets in the water to catch the fish. Because I think the assumption was fish was attracted by that light mm -hmm. on the water. So yeah. I see. So yeah. used in very practical purposes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's see. I've got uh, thank yous. Um, will this be available to share on YouTube or elsewhere? I think everyone who's joined us will get a uh, link to the, the YouTube. So you can use it to fellow educators and high school students. Uh, we have thank you from Justice Johnson. Uh, Marin is asking, do you prefer posho or matoke? <laughs> I prefer matoke. <laughs> <laughs> What's posho? Posho is what I told you called corn. Ah, yes, I see. And, and corn growing up as in a boarding school or like any person growing up in school, corn was something you always ate. So as you grow up, it, it becomes your staple food accidentally because you've grown up eating it like every time you went to school that was your lunch and supper but I think when we grow up we're like oh we are done with school life we want to live a good life so like they will tell you in Uganda you can't go in Uganda in a restaurant and order for posho because they're like that is school life we want to be out <laughs> right. we've so, had too much of that already it's so yeah. much <laughs> so you um, you make matoke the most favorite and I see yeah uh, we have a question. Can you talk about how the night skies are different so close to the equator, like fast sunrises and sunsets? And with your permission, um, I think I will answer that question if that's yes. okay. Okay. Please do. <laughs> so if we imagine, um, let's imagine here that this is what we call the celestial sphere, right? So this is the like this is the whole sky right and the earth is here of course stars are not all at the same distance but it's a nice way to imagine it okay now if you live in uganda you live very close to the equator which means that the sky is the the angle between the north star and the horizon is about 90 degrees this means that as the earth spins, the sky is going to look like it's turning and things are gonna rise quickly out from the east and set quickly in the west. It also means that you get to see every star in the sky. You don't, you're not able to count on as many as we do. We have the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, all that huge chunk of the sky in the north is always visible to us, that's not true in Uganda. In Uganda, that means you can see the Southern Cross. You will see every star in the sky. So that makes it special. I probably used hands in a way that may or may not helped, but I hope that gives you an idea, uh, Christine, of how the night skies are richer, you could say, because you can see all stars there. Um, John, thanks. So I'm, I'm going to say this. I don't know if John and, and Joanne left. They used to live in Milwaukee and now they've moved somewhere else. And mm. in the age of the digital time, they can join us from where they are. So it's very That's nice good. to see people who used to come very often. Mm -hmm. And Paul, thanks for, thanks you for 
uh, sharing us with your country. Um, Maren asks, Uganda is known as the bird watching capital of the world. Do you have a favorite bird after the crested crane? <laughs> Maren, thank you so much. Actually, Maren is my friend. <laughs> I, I know she was, she was watching this. She's asking, do I have a favorite bird? I like, hmm, do I? I like the crested crane though, because you know, it has been written in my memory as the good bird. <laughs> so I don't watch birds as such. But I've seen also as I was growing up, actually what I have for me are the bad birds. <laughs> Bad birds? What are the bad birds? The bad birds is like, like the birds, you know, if they, like we grew up new, we were told so if a certain bird uh, is, 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 is making noise at a weird hour in the night, uh, something bad is happening. Uh, <laughs> so. Right. Well, I'll tell you that this is a random story, but so I grew up in Greece. And uh, in my aunt's cottage, sometimes the rooster would start crowing at any old time at three o'clock in the morning. And the family would say, we'll stew you if you don't stop. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, so let's see. I am going to, uh, Justice is asking, is there a place where we can find a list of the songs you shared? Yeah, I must tell you that I got most of those songs from YouTube. But right, that's right. So maybe Victoria, can we write? Um, so I should thank Victoria also, who's the who's using who's who's organizing all the mechanics. Maybe Victoria can find the links of the songs. Hi, Victoria, <laughs> um, and put them on the YouTube chat. And I'm going to since we've gone I'll now. Right now. I'm sorry. I'll try to find them right now, and I'll throw them on the chat. Okay, that would be lovely. Um, I want to uh, just publicize the uh, future because this was our very first program of Under African Skies. And I just want to point out um, that we do have four more programs coming up. Um, Malawi is next week, Algeria after that. We'll take a little break on the Friday after Thanksgiving and we'll, because we're furloughed, December 4th, we'll have Egypt and the program will wrap up on December 11th for Kenya. Um, the, our favorite Uganda song is Farmer Wange by Sheba, says Marin, your friend. <laughs> okay, enjoy it, Marin. <laughs> yeah, Sheba is actually a common, uh, not a common, but a well-known artist among the youth. So I understand where she's coming from. Yeah. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> and Marin, thank you. Because I, I think that's one person I met when I came here and I'm like, your name looks you good. And I'm like, wow, how could you know that? <laughs> nice. So, nice. Yeah. So Justice thanks you. We all thank you. I would like to principally thank you for taking the time to share your beautiful country and culture with us. Um, and I know that I speak for all these people. There, there are lots of people who are thanking you. So um, I also want to thank you for uh, joining us tonight. And I do hope that you join us for our future programs as well. So let's all give a virtual uh, clap and thank you to Jacqueline. And um, I wish you all the very best. Uh, for the rest of the semester. For our audience, this is your club. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank so you much. so much. Okay. Um, yes, we will, we can email uh, we can email you these links uh, when we send you the the YouTube as well. Thank you very much. Um, and Anika Wilson also um, sends her greetings and thank you. Thank, thank you very you, much my for, supervisor. <laughs> for joining us. Yes. <laughs> She's my supervisor. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. You're very lucky then. <laughs> um, very good. Um, Kiri Bulungi says Maren. 